Azir, thank you so much for a very, very enlightening hour. Uh, we're always, um, you know, great, grateful to have such um, esteemed, you know, figures on, on the show, and you know, love to hear from, especially the South African perspective. So, uh, thank you again from all of us uh, for for participating this uh, this hour. Um, for all of you who have joined, uh, thank you for 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 uh, joining us. Uh, this is the distance socializing um, sessions uh, brought to you by the Concordia Forum. Uh, this is a 12-hour uh, session of uh, amazing speakers and artists. Uh, we've got a lot coming up in the next few hours. You can see our schedule on our Twitter feed or our Facebook page. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Rosina Allen Khan, the Deputy uh, Shadow Minister for the Labor Party, uh, coming up. Imam Saheb Webb, Sheikh Hamza Youssef, Representative Ilhan Omar from the U.S. Uh, is, is later on in the day. Uh, personally name-checked by Donald Trump yesterday. Um, and, and uh, lots of amazing conversation to be had. Uh, but I'm really, really, really excited about this next hour. Um, this is uh, someone I've looked up to for a long time uh, with his work. Uh, Nazir Afsal is a former chief prosecutor uh, in the Northwest here in the UK. Uh, his new book, The Prosecutor, has just come out this week. This just popped up yesterday uh, in my, through my inbox. So I was really excited. I have not finished reading it yet, but um, Nasir will be uh, interviewed by one of our uh, Concordia alumni, uh, Sarah Khan Bashir, an accomplished solicitor and businesswoman in her own right. She has had time to read the book, so she's perfect timing for a, an interview with Nazir. I believe she uh, just read it, finished reading it today as yeah, well. Yeah, brilliant, so. <laughs> and also a quick reader. Um, I, I, I will say, uh, just because I, I found this very, very touching, Nazir, uh, sadly his, his elder brother passed away. Uh, not long ago, um, likely of COVID-19, and he shared his thoughts uh, on British television uh, about the experience he's gone through. And, and I just wanted to just say from all of us, you know, um, I know this is a difficult time for you and your family, but we thank you for, for sharing your time with us and you and your family are in our thoughts and prayers uh, um, at this time. So I'm gonna hand it over uh, to, to Sarah and Nazir now um, and uh, take it away. Hello. Hi, Nazir. Assalamu alaikum, Sarah. How are you doing? Welcome, Salam. I'm good. I can see you now. I couldn't see you earlier. Uh, thank you for joining us. And You're welcome. Again, can I just reiterate what Shahid Zahid just said, that we extend our condolences to you during quite a difficult time. And thank you for joining us. Um, I know Zahid has introduced uh, Nazir already, but I have to say I'm a bit of a fan, Nazir. As a, as a fellow lawyer, you are one of those legal legends that many lawyers look up to and aspire to be. Um, your courage, your legal skills, your, your ability to think outside the box, and all of that is covered in the book. Uh, I have to say, I did read it, I could not put it down. Amazing book. Um, it, it gives a great history of, of the, the major cases you've been involved with. Um, can I just ask, what inspired you to write the book? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Well, I, I, as you know, I've, I left the prosecution world five years ago, and um, I've been very busy since. In fact, if anything, I've been busier in the last uh, five years than I was in prosecuting. But um, a couple of years ago, Penguin came to me and said, Nazir, look, have you thought about writing about what you've done? And I must admit, it, it didn't occur to me they uh, made it abundantly clear to me that it was something that they were interested in, uh, as uh, I think Saad has just joined us, she's a well-known authoress. Uh, when, uh, when you um, first start sitting down and trying to contemplate, I thought initially what I would do is just simply write about some landmark cases that I was involved in, but uh, it went beyond that. They were more interested, in, as I was actually, in reflecting on what got me to where I was. And so, as you all know, Sarah, the first three, four chapters are yeah. literally about my first 20 years uh, before mm -hmm. I became a prosecutor. Um, my upbringing in Birmingham, my, my family, um, the challenges I faced back then. Because I think, in many respects, the career I, uh, I ended up taking was built on the background, the experiences I had when I was a youth. And, uh, and being the son of an immigrant and how, um, that uh, affects your everything, um, made me realize that actually I wanted to do this. I want to do this justice. It's taken a significant amount of time, uh, about 18 months. You've read it in 24 hours. It took me 18 months or thereabouts uh, mm -hmm. to get it to you. 
Um, but I'm very pleased with it. And I'm pleased because um, there are stories. I'm, I've, I'm being very privileged. I've been very privileged because uh, victims, survivors, witnesses, other professionals, people in NGOs have been working tirelessly to support uh, those who are most vulnerable, uh, have trusted me. Uh, and they put their trust in me. And because they did that, uh, I then decided to do something with it. One of the things I try to make clear in the book is one of the most um, underrated skills of a leader is listening. Um, we're very good at talking. Uh, we're very good at writing. Uh, but we are not very good at listening. And, and I think, if anything, my successes, if that's the right word, and to some extent my failures, are built on the fact that I've listened. I listen to those who are most impacted by criminality, by, uh, by just misbehavior, uh, by, I've, I've called it all sorts of different words in the book, terrorism, gender terrorism, you name it. Uh, and I actively acted upon what they did. I was never the expert. They were the experts. I was just simply in a position where I could do something with what they told me. And I think I would have been really neglectful if I didn't. Um, and I, my message, if there's any message in the book, it's, it's about listening. I listen to what people have to say. And the next message is, don't just simply file it away, do something with whatever it is that you've heard. Um, so I didn't enjoy the writing process, I'll be honest with you. It's not, it's not my skill set. It requires extraordinary discipline. Um, but I enjoyed the reflective process. I enjoyed uh, the editing process. Um, one of the strange things is, as you've read it, Sarah, I don't think I've mentioned one celebrity or famous person, or maybe one or two. Yeah. Um, but there's loads and loads uh, yeah. that I've dealt with and I'm aware of. Uh, and uh, I think it, it was better not to, it was better to focus on the ordinary people uh, who are most impacted by, by crime uh, than to just focus on people who would, might, might sell the book, i.e. The, yeah. the kind of famous names that I've dealt with. So yeah. uh, enjoy the process. Um, let's see where it goes from there. Yeah, I mean, what struck me, a couple of things out of what you said there, it wasn't just the listening you did, it was the then using that as a driving force for change. And, and that was what was so eye-opening about the book. We've all heard about the famous cases you've been involved with. We've heard about the one-line quotes that people, you know, bring up in the, again and again about what you said. But what we don't often see is you took what often was a negative about a case or even your personal events in your life whatever it was shaped how you then dealt with crime in the future and you didn't just stop yeah. at prosecuting you then went and on and to try and change the law successfully on many occasions that's I mean, it's very kind of you to say that I'm, I'm looking i mean pretty much everybody on this call is a victim yeah. whether they see it or not uh, i certainly growing up was um, I, mean, I didn't have neighbours, I had witnesses. There was just so much, <laughs> there was so much criminality in, on the streets of Birmingham, uh, and particularly if you were, were from a minority in the 60s and 70s, um, which meant that uh, if you weren't attacked, you were abused. If you weren't bullied, uh, you, were, um, you were sworn out. You name it, there was all sorts of things happening. But I had a loving family around me, and I, I hope I've tried to bring that out, is that um, I did have a safe place. Uh, and yeah. sadly, loads of people don't have a safe place. And so um, it's, you know, I, I must admit, I mean, I think Sider may agree with me on this. I don't really like lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, um, my father, God bless him, said to me, you know, you only need a lawyer to protect you from other lawyers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was in many respects right. I actually thought the law was just a, a tool. Let's yeah. use the law as a tool uh, to deal with some of the the challenges we face as a society. But he, I had to be pushed in that direction. I, you know, because I remember when, when we first started talking about forced marriage and honor-based violence, for example, which, which is where Sarah and I, we first uh, met, I guess. Um, you know, back, back, back then, uh, firstly, no men were talking about it. It was all mm. women and NGOs uh, working in this field. And they, they came to me and said, Nazir, look, you're in a very privileged position. Can you organize some kind of uh, conference to discuss this subject. Uh, because I was, uh, at that time I was um, chief in London, I organized something right opposite parliament in, mm. in Westminster, because again, um, let's make it very clear, MPs are generally very busy, I would say very lazy, but they were very busy. Uh, and so I had to make it really easy for them to cross the road to come to a conference <laughs> and, to hear, right. and, to hear, and to hear the voices of, 
of victims and survivors. But once I'd done that, once I'd heard what they had to say, the easiest thing for me to do would be to go back and just do everything else I was doing. I, you know, I was responsible for 125,000 cases a year. And so it's easy to wrap yourself in just general casework and not think strategically about anything. And uh, it was the groups themselves, uh, Carmen Ivana and, and uh, many others, who said, Nazir, look, firstly, no man's talking about this. Could you do that? And secondly, can you use whatever influence you have to try and dip, dip, bring the change? And they made me think that way. And mm. I, of course, uh, once they'd made me think that way, they then had to inform me and, you know, Again, people make real assumptions that if you're brown, somehow you must know all about these subjects. No, yeah. you don't. Uh, and particularly if you're a man, you know, there are male victims of forced marriage, but they're small by some considerable number. And so once they'd given me their insight and their expertise, my job then was to use the doors that I had open to me to bring the change. And so absolutely, I was run, run off the home office. And, and, and again, there was a real openness at that time. Uh, in the home office to listen and they listened uh, and uh, this is 15 years ago um, and they said look we want to develop a strategy can you help us in that I said yes uh, I then said well we need to bring all the other agencies together so we had a work group set up of education health prosecution police social services children uh, children's department everybody around the table all the NGOs uh, we defined it which was, was a challenge in itself uh, and then we needed to bring about uh, the significant chains that need to be brought together again informed by the survivor's experience and so within 12 months we had a national strategy uh, not just a prosecution strategy a national government strategy we had uh, every government department issuing guidelines uh, and all of that was informed by casework because again another bit of learning is that actually when you tell stories that really is what impacts if I talk to people in legalese or in um, yeah. you know uh, um, acad academic language, uh, it'll go right over their heads. If I tell them Hesha Jonas was murdered because a teacher ran her parent up, her father up, and said that she had a boyfriend, they go, oh, really? Mm. Uh, what can we do differently to prevent that happening? If I tell them that, um, you know, uh, the sizable failings of police and other agencies that meant the Banaz Mahmood was murdered, in yeah. 2006, you know, the one you begin to tell them stories is when it finally registers with them that this is something that they either have dealt with or they mm. will come across. And mm. so then it was easy. Then it becomes easier. Literally, what I did, Sarah, was scare the living day out of them. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you really want to be disciplined for failing somebody? Do you want a serious case review pointing out your failures? Do you mm. want to end up on the front page of whatever it is? Um, and they didn't want any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so they then had to respond. And you mentioned legislation. The Forced Marriage yeah. Civil Protection Act was passed in 2007. And that was a private member's bill. Um, and uh, again, the parliamentarians around the table will, will tell you, very rare for a private member's bill to become law. Uh, and so we had a conversation with uh, the then Attorney General. Uh, and sometimes the legal case ain't enough. Sometimes the the emotional case, the moral case isn't enough. Sometimes you have to build the business case. And so uh, what I learned was that the bringing in that legislation, which produ produced protection orders for the first time in the UK history, um, the reason why it wasn't being supported by the then government in 2007 was it, cost, it would cost them two million pounds a year uh, to enact mm -hmm. it, all the training, all the whatever it needs doing. And so when I sat down with the Attorney General, I said to him, do you know how much it costs to prosecute one murder? And they, he said, no, not really. I said, it costs one million pounds to investigate and prosecute one homicide. I now have data that shows there were 12 murders that year, which, which were honor related. So if I was able to reduce, reduce the number of murders by two, that pays for your legislation. Yeah. Suddenly, yeah. Mini, uh, eyes <laughs> light up. Oh, okay, we'll do that then. And so suddenly it became adopted by the government and then it became law. But sometimes you just have to, it's again listening, listening to what it is that the obstacles were, realizing the obstacles in that case were, were not legal or financial, well, just simply financial, and then presenting an argument as to why financially it would benefit them too. And the reality, of course, is last year there were half as many murders that were honor related. So we've saved, we've saved the government 
tens of millions of pounds if they yeah. want to see it, yeah. if they want to see it in in cold terms. But more importantly, we've saved hundreds of lives. Yeah. I mean, you're incredibly humble about your achievements. I know you said you had groups that supported and said, will you speak for us? But it, it does take a lot of courage. Um, and given the job that you did, there is this um, uh, idea that prosecutors, they're, they're not paid to do any more than just to do their job. And you showed that you can do more. Um, you talked about um, stories. Now, these were, the, for me, the compelling parts of the book. You talked about Safia. You talked about Anuj. Uh, these are all just names, but when, uh, without giving too much away, because everybody should read this book, yeah. the impact of, of Safia's case was, it, 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 we hear it in the news, we hear it in the media, but the way you told the story and the lessons learned from that must have had a massive, and indeed it did, it sort of led the way for the Modern Slavery Act. Um, but, but Safia's and people like her, Samara, uh, Anuj, they... You, did, you said earlier, you didn't, I didn't want to mention celebrities, but these people, I think, have made a far bigger impact on you. Oh, 100%. I mean, uh, I, you, you mentioned uh, Anuj Bidvez. Anuj, yeah. Anuj was an Indian student that was murdered in Manchester by some tin pot gangster. At the time, uh, people thought it was a race attack. Mm. I remember um, uh, some people wanted to exploit it as a race attack. We shouldn't be exploiting cases that aren't race attacks uh, because it damages our, uh, you know, when, when they really are race attacks. But anyway, yes. in Anuja's case, he, was, he came here to study. Uh, his family uh, borrowed 30 million, 30,000 pounds, which yeah. must have been felt like 30 million pounds to a family mm -hmm. uh, to get him to study here. Within three months, he was dead. And um, the Indian government at that time were desperately keen to send all their students back home. People forget all this happened. Uh, mm. And it was important to prosecute that case with speed, uh, and we did, uh, but we're also with empathy because the, the, her parent, his parents were, I mean, they made me cry in court. You know, I think I, I, I've written, about the, written yeah. about the scene where his mother, after the, the guy is convicted, holds my hand and, and kisses yeah. it and, and says, thank you. And I'm, I'm thinking, thank me, you've lost your son. You know, literally, what, how can I, why? Why are you thanking me, you know? Uh, you, you, cannot not, you cannot not be impacted by mm. stories. Safi is a good example of, uh, well, the best example I can think of of modern slavery. Again, as you say, read the book if you, if you want to know the detail. Most people won't know, won't know about the case. But That's if right. anything, that is the most, that is the most di difficult case I've ever dealt with. Yeah. She was the most vulnerable person I've ever come across. Everything, learning difficulties, language difficulties, uh, deaf, mute, you name it, uh, everything that she ha had was made, a, made her immensely vulnerable and therefore was literally being uh, enslaved by, by a family here in the UK. And we had to, there was no book, there's no protocol, there's, there are no guidelines as to what you do. We literally had to develop them bespoke for her. And, you know, there is, as you say, enormous optimism at the end of, of what happened yeah. that, what happened in that case, which again, I don't want to um, uh, share today but it, it, it left me feeling why this is why I do this job I do this job because <laughs> yeah. I did this job because I wanted uh, to save lives I wanted to protect lives I wanted to deliver justice I wanted to make people feel immensely happy uh, with their lives and then to move on you know somebody said to me uh, a victim said to me that um, their re their recovery only began once they were believed by me yeah you know it doesn't matter what anybody else said to them. It doesn't matter, you know, everything's going to be all right, blah, 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 all that stuff. It's when I said, and it was uh, Stuart, Chat. one of Stuart Hall's, one was, of Stuart Hall's was it, victims. That was a Rochdale. That was a Rochdale. No, no, it was one of Stuart Hall's victims. Ah. She said, she, uh, she was the one that was, he was found guilty, the BBC presenter was found guilty of, of, of sexual abuse of 11 young women and one, one he was found not guilty of. And I went to see the one he was found not guilty of. It was my duty to do so. And I said to her, I'm really sorry that I couldn't give you closure. And she said, you gave me closure the moment that you believed me. And to my mind, that, you know, those words have never left me. They made me realize, I go back to my point about listening, yeah. that if we listened, then we could do something about it. It's because we prefer to hide, or you know, all of virtually everything in my book is hidden in plain sight. Mm. We all see it down the streets, in our valleys, yeah. in our communities, wherever it may be, but we turn a blind eye to it, you know. And I didn't. I chose not to because it was important. That somebody did choose yeah. not to, and and they fulfilled me. They made me feel absolutely um, 
uh, that I was doing the right thing. And you, may, you mentioned personal cost. You know, I, I'm probably the only person in this country, if not the world, that's been on an Al Qaeda death list <laughs> and also had a far right demonstration outside his door. Yeah. You know, so I'm getting it from both sides. If you get it from both sides, you're probably in the right place. Um, yeah. But you know, the reality is, I mean, the Sunday Times has done a review today of the book, which is, I'm really proud of it. It's very immensely favorable, but there's one criticism. Uh, and it says that uh, I don't touch on my, my own personal circumstances as in the last 20 odd years uh, with any detail. And there's a reason for that. It's because they come from my family. You know, I chose the job that I chose. Yeah. It, it's not right. They didn't choose to be my children, sure. my partner. Et they didn't choose any of that. Therefore, I made a judgment that I shouldn't talk about them in the book because it wouldn't be right to do so. Uh, and, but, you know, as you say, there is a personal cost to any leadership. Uh, and uh, I think everybody around uh, this table will have experienced it. Yeah. You, you talk about doing the right thing um, and not mentioning your family. But what struck me throughout reading the book is that you always came back to mum and dad and the way mm. they shaped your early years. And your mother is, a, I'm inspired so much by her and the early work she did. She really is a force of nature. That's what you called her in the book. Yeah. Um, tell us about those. Tell us about the young Nazir who watched mum do the right thing, who watched dad or actually helped dad write letters to yeah. put things well, right did, for those who weren't able to. Well, on, on, the, on the letter writing, I didn't have any choice. Dad sits there and says, Dad sits there and says, some community member wants a letter written. Nazir, could you write it? Well, all right, mm -hmm. fine, Dad. Uh, I had no choice. But, uh, but the fact that he was, um, you know, you mentioned my brother passed away a week and a half ago. We buried, finally buried him. You know, as a Muslim, it take, took nine days to bury my brother, which, oh. is, um, uh, which is really difficult. And to, you know, mm -hmm. and to, to know that he was in a fridge for all that time uh, is really, really a uh, horrible, horrible mm -hmm. thing to recognize. But 50 years ago, my father created the Association, so the yeah. Patan Association in the UK, and he did so because he did so because uh, there were people dying who were immigrants who wanted to be buried back in Pakistan, and there was no means to do that. And he decided if we as a community come together and put a bit of money in every year, then we can pay for each one of us to be buried. And so my brother's burial took place last week. Sensible. It must have yeah. cost four thousand pounds or thereabouts. It cost yeah. me nothing yeah. because we've been paying X amount every year small amounts, all of us as a community. And that was my father's doing. He created that level of community, uh, well, co co you know, cohesion. My mother, as you say, um, you know, if you think about it, she arrived in this country uh, in her uh, well, late, late 30s. At that time, she had three children. When she was here within five years, she had another four. So she had seven of us, mm -hmm. uh, four of us, um, you know, little, t little tiddlers. Uh, <laughs> and she'd be going around the streets of the inner, inner city of Birmingham with push chairs and whatever it is, and literally haranguing other women uh, about what they are doing. Uh, you know, why are you contemplating marrying your 14 year old girl off yeah. to somebody back home? Why? You know, she hasn't even finished her education. Why? What well, we came here to give our children the opportunities that we gave them. And, and I, you know, I, she's God bless her. She's 91. She's still with us. She's not very well, but she's still sure. with us. And, um, but yes, yeah, she was an um, extraordinary force where she made me realize, well, without me knowing, I didn't know any of this. It came, obviously went in without um, uh, deliberately yeah. uh, as, you know, and taking it. Um, she made me realize what in individuals can do. You know, the power of one, yeah. you know, one person. You don't have to, no bureaucracy. You've just been hearing from uh, the N Nelson Mandela's uh, grandson, haven't you? You know, no, no bureaucracy changes the world. It's individuals that change the world. And so she changed people's worlds. My father changed people's worlds. And they made me realize that I can do the same. I don't have to wait for a uh, national strategy or, or uh, national funding. Yeah. You know, uh, I can use whatever tools I have at my disposal, whatever, I don't know, networks I have uh, in order to bring the change. And that's something that they taught me uh, a long time ago without me realizing, quite yeah. frankly, that I was learning that. Yeah. Um, now, the book itself, the, the, the opening paragraph is quite gripping. It talks about an incident where you were um, chased and um, racially attacked. Why, why did you choose to start with that? Uh, 
you know, I, the, when Penguin first came to me and said, Nazir, uh, we want to hear about all your cases. Uh, just write a little bit about your first 20 years. Mm. Uh, and I wrote that bit first. And they said, uh oh, we need more of this. We need to know more about what made you what you are. It was that those kinds of incidents made me what I was. Yeah. You know, it, it, it starts off, it's a prologue basically of, of me being chased by a group of men and attacked by a group of men who used my head as a football. Um, you know, sad, sadly, or thankfully, they were rubbish in football, which mm. is why I live to tell the tale. But <laughs> the point is, I wanted, to, it was, um, one, it was what it was like growing up as a, as a youth. Uh, secondly, it was that my father said, uh, what's the point of reporting it to the police? Mm. You know, why would they take us seriously? Uh, which was clearly what he felt. And, uh, and, the, and I think the words, no justice, there is no justice, uh, were ringing in my uh, head. And, you know, he, he told me that and that's how I felt it. Uh, I didn't believe it, but that's what I thought. So I wanted people to appreciate where I come from and where most of us come from. Most of us feel, sadly, that nobody would take us seriously. That if we reported something, nobody would take us seriously. Uh, that they would treat us with contempt throughout the process. Because lawyers are extremely keen on process. Mm. You know, uh, process is just a means to an end, as far as, far as I'm concerned. But lawyers generally, you know, you know, you have to do it at this time. Then you have to serve that, mm. and you receive this. You know, you know that better than anybody yeah. else. Yeah. Uh, but I was never keen on process. I was keen on final outcomes. How do we get to justice? And what is justice? Uh, because it varies from place to place. But, uh, you know, I think that they taught me, for, well, they made it very clear to me that in their view, there was none, there was no justice. I need, to, I need to show them otherwise, that actually you can deliver justice if you do, as you say, the right things. And if you work across teams and if you work across networks mm. and uh, I'm, there are lots of people committed to delivering it. Yeah. Um Again, I don't want to give too much away in the book, but tell us a little bit about um, sort of just a change from the law. We don't want to bore everybody with, with, with our legal processes, but t tell us about the obligatory 1970s trip to Pakistan by road. I've done um, that as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, we, 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 my, my brother, God bless him, who just passed away, actually, it was his wedding. Oh, okay. uh, right. So uh, it, uh, arranged marriage, we, we, well, I was eight years old, um, my my brothers were six, seven, my daughter, my sister was five, uh, and my mother and father decided, let's do it. And this was 1970, when Iran was open, Afghanistan was yeah. open, uh, Yugoslavia was one. So literally, you could mm. do it. And we did it by transit van. Uh, and you, you can quite imagine, uh, I can't imagine, actually, ha having all of my family behind me. But nonetheless, <laughs> my father and mother had... Yeah. Uh, decided that was the right thing to do. And they went, it took us the best part of 30 days uh, to, get, to get to Pakistan. And then uh, I, I tried to explain or tried to describe what it was like for me uh, experiencing Pakistan for the first time. Things like, you know, again, we, do, we don't maybe have this now, but uh, a lot of um, quote unquote hippies uh, ended up in Pakistan uh, and India at the yeah. end, end, end of the 60s. I was really surprised by that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, it doesn't, shouldn't surprise you. The Beatles were very much into that <laughs> type of... So uh, in the village that I lived, my family yeah. lived in, there were all these German and Swiss uh, hippies uh, <laughs> who'd come to live the life of whatever it was. And so my yeah. interaction with them was literally my first interaction with white people. Strange. Yeah. I went to Pakistan for my <laughs> first interaction <laughs> yeah. with white people. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, and it, it, taught me, it taught me a tremendous amount, meeting my extended family for the first time, um, experiencing uh, how people do justice, i.e. you throw stones at each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, land disputes are settled uh, with a little battle. Um, you know, that's the way <laughs> things were yeah. back then. Uh, and, and then, of course, the journey back, again, I don't want to spoil it for people, but some, there's a tragic event. Uh, yeah, on, on the return journey, which again, I think had a, only because of, again, thinking about the book and writing the book, did I reflect upon that, that event and the impact it had on me. You know, the death of someone who was very close to me, uh, a realization that maybe I could have done something about it or we could have done something about it uh, in retrospect. Of course, yeah, that's, been, that's been the benefit of 50 years of hindsight. Mm. Um, but clearly, we couldn't at the time. And, but it made me realize. Um, that maybe it had had a longer impact on me than I imagined. The book, it, it, it was almost, it's almost like counselling. You know, yeah. having, 
having thought about it again and read it, uh, you know, thought about that, those events, mm. it made me realize actually that did have a stark impact. It made me realize um, that I do not want to, to carry dead bodies in my hands. Uh, I want to be able to prevent them happening in the first place. And I think uh, that journey did more than just open my eyes mm. uh, to uh, Pakistan, uh, but it also opened my eyes to uh, vulnerability. Yeah, I mean, that's the continuing theme, isn't it, in the book, in that these are not just cases to you. They do leave a lasting impression. And you, yep. and you seem to ensure that that impression is used for the good of others. You know, this is the whole eye-opening thing for me that each and every case, each and every personal event in your life is, is you use that as a, as a force for change um, and to make sure that they are, like you've just talked about the, the honor killings, that, that, that we don't see more of that kind of crime. You feel like, I feel like from reading the book, you don't feel like you've done the job. So it's not just to get the conviction. I feel that you think that you haven't done the job until then you do something more with that lesson. Do you, do you know, Sarah, there's something about, again, it's, I think it's a, an immigrant trait. Yeah. Uh, when I left the CPS in 2015, I had 100 days leave to take. Yeah. I, yeah. I literally hadn't been taking leave. I'd been working weekends, evenings. My family, God bless them, I don't know how they coped. But the point is that I had uh, decided that I wanted to... to you, know, you, can't, you can't commit yourself to this whole half-heartedly. Mm. So you're right. When I, reached a, when I got a conviction, when, I, when somebody was... Even when things didn't go right... It was that, well, that, that even more so then. It's more important for me to go out. And, you, know, you, know, you know those t-shirts you have when you've been on a, yeah. to a concert with all the tour, the tour of a particular band or something. Literally, if I, mines would have Royal College GPs. It would have uh, you know, every faith institution. I went everywhere because I wanted to get the message, message out directly to other professionals and other agencies and to the wider public. Uh, and which is why the media is really important. You know, I was always... Um, I think criticized uh, for using the media as I did. Um, but, but that's how you get to hundreds of thousands of people. That's how you get them to change their behaviors. Yeah. Uh, but I literally decided that it wasn't enough to just prosecute the case. I, I thankfully had great teams of people working with me. Um, they were able to deal with the cases day to day to enable me to go out and do the, the awareness stuff, the challenging stuff, mm. the strategic stuff. And, and I will, I, there isn't a place, there isn't a part of this, of the United Kingdom, if not the world, quite frankly, where I haven't been to talk about the things that we've learned mm. or the things I've personally learned. You know, the Americans, after, you mentioned honor-based violence, after 2008, the American State Department came, came to me and said, Nazir, we need to talk to you about this. Can we, we need to learn from the UK experience. The Americans think we're better than them at anything. It's, it's something, isn't it? Mm. Uh, but literally... Uh, you know, so I was, I was regularly talking to the State Department. I went to speak to them in New York and Washington a couple of times. Strangely, strangely, they stopped asking me in November 2016. I have no idea who was elected then that might have prevented <laughs> oh, uh, any, any engagement uh, mm. with a British Muslim. But, um, yeah. but you know, I, the countries around the world were looking at our experiences. Even though it would kill me, I would fly. I, f I flew to Istanbul. I flew in the morning, I presented something at a conference over there, and I flew back in the evening. Yeah, my family think I've been holidaying. Uh, I saw nothing of any of the countries that I've been to, um, but it was important for me to get the messages out to the audiences uh, mm. directly, as you say, with the stories that yeah. hopefully will have a greater impact. Yeah. Now, we can't speak to you without talking about Child A and the Rochdale grooming gang, a really famous case. Um, most people will have heard about in the media it was uh, prosecuting a child grooming gang successfully. However, many people may not be aware that this was something that was reported to the police many, many years before you arrived in Manchester. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know what was it about the case that made you think, I want to look back into this. And you could probably see, given the history that you have, what the consequences were for the Muslim community in Rochdale. What, what made you, you know, want to pick mm. that up and, and, and say, right, okay. I'm going to prosecute this successfully? Um, because nobody else was, I guess. That was part of the part of mm. it. Um, and to the, yeah, the, this is the BBC made a film called Three Girls, which is, I think, still available on Netflix. Yeah. 
um, which people should watch if they get the opportunity. And it's based on this case, and it is this case, to be frank. The actor who played me is much more handsome than I am. Um, and my wife's got a picture of him on the wall, which tells you uh, everything you need to know. Um, but uh, 2008, she made allegations. Mm. The police carried out a poor investigation. Prosecutors decided that there was no opportunity to prosecute uh, because the victim had um, chaotic, troubled background. Mm. No, jury, no jury would believe her. We use excuses left, right, and center. And mm. that was a, a classic excuse. Um, but uh, the Times kept um, looking at this subject uh, and uh, they wrote various articles. Uh, I was um, aware of it. I, the, the far right began to exploit these types of cases. Um, British National Party, as it was then, uh, were regularly demonstrating on the streets of, the, of England, particularly uh, saying, why are we not dealing with these cases more effectively? I've written in a book about my telephone conversation with the British National Party's lawyers uh, which I think uh, people should uh, pay some attention to. Yeah. Uh, but when, when I moved to uh, Greater Manchester, Manchester where I am now, um, I asked my teams, do we have anything like this type, of, um, this, this type of case? And they brought this to me and they told me what had happened previously. And I sat and watched the, um, uh, the video disclosures and I said, well, I believe her. Why are we making an assumption that yeah. a jury wouldn't believe her? Surely the problem is us not being able to build the case as effectively as we could do mm. now that we knew there were so many other victims rather than her and uh, so for the first time in, in certainly in my experience uh, we, I decided to overturn that decision not to prosecute and to bring that prosecution mm. uh, and then it was necessary to put um, a absolutely bespoke victim support program around these victims because to put it bluntly these girls had never trusted an adult in their lives never mm. mind their own families school teachers, they didn't trust any adult. Uh, so why would they trust me or the prosecution or the police? And so we had to put something really bespoke around, around them. In the meantime, we had the far right mm. shouting and screaming, you know, as they, as they do uh, to exploit these things and make it abundantly clear that's all they do is exploit these things. Uh, and then we had uh, the defense team whose strategy was very clear. Uh, and I, I would do the same thing in their shoes, probably, uh, which is disrupt this case. You know, mm. The best thing that could happen was this case never gets to trial, yeah. you know, uh, or never gets to the jury. Uh, and so we were focused entirely on getting this case to the jury. We did. Uh, they were convicted. And then it, it was not in, you know, then we know, and all of us know, if, you, if those of us were around, uh, how much attention this got. I mean, this was the first of its type. This was the first um, that people began to look at. This, this is before Savile. This is before yeah. the Me Too, Me Too generation. This is literally ahead of the game, if that's the right phrase, which is why it was such a landmark case. But it was also important then, Sarah, to sh talk about what, what was going on. Yeah. So you had the far right saying it's all to do with the ethnicity of the men. No, it was something to do with the ethnicity of the men. It was more to do with the fact they were men, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, so I had to try and deb debunk that, literally debunk that. So I was writing articles, I was doing interviews. The prime minister at the time uh, contacted me and asked me to explain, and I, I did. Um, I was doing what I could to explain this in every fora. I, I was talking in town hall meetings because it was important for us to appreciate. Look, somebody said to me, Nazir, why do you seem to pick on subjects that are a stick to hit minority communities with? And my response always is that we should be carrying our own stick. Yeah. You know, if we don't deal with our own issues, with our own challenges, with our own bad guys, for want of a better term, then we are, we're giving ammunition mm. to the far right, to those who are hostile towards us, to those who want to hate us. Why can't we just deal with it ourselves? And what was encouraging, and it remains encouraging, is that there is now so much work going on uh, in uh, tackling sexual abuse within our communities, by people from uh, our communities and the wider community, making mm. this abundantly clear. And I keep always contextualizing it. 84% of uh, sex offenders in this country are British white men. Yeah. You know, uh, disproportionately when it comes to this model of sexual abuse, uh, British Pakistani men are engaged disproportionately. This model, the yeah. most likely place for a child to be abused is within the family. The second largest group is online. The second, third largest group is in institutions, places of worship, schools, etc. 
this type of street grooming, as strangely as it may sound, despite the fact there are thousands of victims, is the smallest group by comparison. Mm. Um, so we contextualize it, but then we, then we deal with the issue. Why is it that we have so many British Pakistani men doing this? When people say, oh, it's a Muslim thing, and they often bring up, oh, the prophet married a nine-year-old, yeah, it's yeah. A, you know, whatever it is. And I, I said, King John married a 12-year-old, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's make this, it's not about religion. The last thing these mad, men had yeah. on their mind yeah. was their religion when they started abusing uh, these girls, uh, mm -hmm. and they did. And so I had to keep doing that. Uh, and it's a shame, uh, it is a shame that there, were men, there were, weren't many of us. Yeah. You know, a lot of it fell to me, uh, which is why, you know, the far right then came for me. You know, um, not, because, um, not because of who I was, but because of what I stood for. I, I damaged their narrative. Their narrative is that all mm. of us, all of us of brown skin are responsible for this abuse regardless of who we are and when they discovered that I was the one to prosecute this case mm. they had to damage me and so you know I had as a far-right demonstration outside of my door I had I had to explain to my children how a panic alarm works in yeah. my house yeah. I had um, 70 I had my kids could only go to school for three months in a taxi because that was a safe, mm. secure way for them to do that. Uh, I got 17,000 emails in a week calling for me to be sacked yeah. and deported. You know, they came for me because they wanted to personalize it. And I had to deal with that at the same time as try and challenge and change the way we worked. Mm. And I was very fortunate that my boss at the time was somebody you would probably all know, Keir Starmer, I've heard of him. Yeah, uh, and, um, I think I have, uh, yeah. and, uh, and so Keir was very open uh, to me leading on this work. Uh, I think I can understand if you'd said to me, Nazir, let's keep you away from this so it doesn't become a brown on brown issue. You know, I could, I could, I could, I could understand, I heard people say that, I could, but Keir never said that. Nazir said, you're the expert, you, you're the one people associate with this type of criminality, you deal with it. You know, you, you've got my full support, deal with it. And so, yes, we put national plans in place, national strategies, built up specialisms. And we've got to the stage now where you know, we've prosecuted and they've prosecuted dozens and dozens and dozens mm. of these types of crime. Mm. Uh, and I hope that they are now getting to the stage where we've got a, uh, a good handle on it and we're able to bring justice to people, quite frankly, uh, who were never given that justice before. Um, but I can't do that alone. I have mm. to do that with networks. I have to do that with other men standing up you know, when it comes to domestic abuse of violence against women and girls, you know, there is such a responsibility on them. All, we seem to put all the responsibility on women and girls. Yeah. No, men, honestly, I, 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 I beg his belief, Sarah, a couple of years ago, I was doing a talk in a northern city. I won't mention the name Bradford. Um, uh, uh, and uh, there were 300 men in the room. It was White mm. Ribbon Day, which is the day of male... Yeah. Um, yes male support for women who are yeah. uh, encountering this kind of abuse. And the 300 men in the room, and I was listening to the conversations over tea and coffee before I spoke. And they were all talking about the fact they wanted a selfie with me, with the chief exec of the council, with the chief constable. It seemed to me that so many of them were there for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. They were there to look like they were doing the right things rather than the right things. Mm. So when I stood up and mm. I said that, uh, and I, I, I said something I regret to some extent. I said, how many of you have actually beaten your wives at home? Uh, didn't go, that didn't go down particularly well. Mm. Uh, but the point is, unless we challenge our own, yes. the behaviours of other men, then yeah. why are we putting all, all the burden on women and girls to deal with the issues where we are the perpetrators, where we are the problem? Yeah. I have so many questions for you. We have around 15 minutes. But, you know, just to finish off on that, I think, um, you, you did famously say, um, I do feel there is a deficit of leadership in some parts of the Muslim community. Yeah. It could be much more challenging of certain behaviours, like you've just said, using your own stick. Has, how have things changed since then? You, you, you talk about your personal sacrifices that you've had to make in order to, to do this kind of work. Do you feel that has been in vain or do you think no, attitudes no. have changed? I think, I mean, I'm optimistic. I'm looking at Saida here, I'm looking at Mohammed Amin here. I'm looking at people in politics uh, who get it. Yeah. You know? Uh, I, I, we need more. Absolutely do we need more. Uh, we need, uh, as I say, more men. But I'm much more optimistic. You know, uh, uh, 
you know, I, do you I, feel it has? I'm, I mean, from from no, well, the you know, the pro- problem we've got, problem we've got uh, is austerity's had an impact. Mm. So the services aren't there that were there. Uh, I, I still think there's a deficit of leadership. I, I think we we like to focus on areas as a community where we're a victim mm. more than where we might actually be yeah. the problem. So you know, uh, it's uh, whenever I start talking about this subject. People, some some men would come back to me and say, "You're just giving them an opportunity to hate us." No, no, we hate. I hate you for doing this. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's not. A, we shouldn't be thinking that that's what we're doing. It's, let's clean our yeah. own homes and our yeah. own communities. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm of course I'm optimistic because I look around the country. I go around the country. I'm patron of nine NGOs now, all working in this these fields of mm. violence against women and girls in the UK and. They are all determined and dedicated and, and they're working ex- extraordinarily hard mm. to protect people. Um, I, I, what, I, what, I, what I'm always concerned about is how they do so on a shoestring. Yeah. You know, we, we require them to do it for nothing. You know, mm. we, we, are, we require them to work as volunteers. You know, we should value them. You know, we should pay them properly to do this job because mm. the... Uh, the outcomes, if, the, if we can deal with violence against women and girls, we can reduce the impact on families and children. We will be better as a society. So mm. I think it's really short-sighted uh, to deal with a problem uh, with volunteers and with NGOs. Um, I will do what I can, but I really do think uh, that um, our chancellor and other chancellors around the world really need to put a great deal more money into the sector because mm. the, you know, ultimately we can then be so, uh, we'll, 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 be, we'll be much, much safer as a community going forward. Mm. So it's, it's going back and looking at the root rather than sticking plaster on, on a, a wound all the time. Totally, totally. Yeah. Children, children are being abused right now. One in 30 children will suffer sexual abuse. One in 30 children yeah. will suffer sexual abuse. Um, yeah, neglect. Uh, violence, one in four women suffer domestic abuse, one in five women are stalked, one in five women uh, suffer uh, uh, sexual violence, um, two women has gone up in, during lockdown, two women a week are killed. You know, come on. Yeah. Uh, the data tells us this is a pandemic, never mind an epidemic, yeah. uh, and we need the, the same level of resources, the same... Um, you know, COBRA meetings, the same mm. impact to tackle this subject because we will all be safer and we will flourish as a community and as, as a society. Yeah, um, I'm hogging all the, the, the questions here, Nazir. We've got some yeah. on the chat. If I can just um, pick up on some of those. Um, uh, Shahid, uh, we, we, we've, I think we may have dealt with it, but I'll read it out anyway. Thank you so much, Nazir, for your time. What effect did the Rochdale inquiry have on you, your faith as a Muslim? Do you feel that being a Muslim and an Asian man was a significance to the victims? Um, I've, well, I've spoke, I speak to Gloria quite frequently and she believes it was. Uh, you know, it's, it has to be about perception. Mm-hmm. Um, she is actually, you know, if she, if she, thankfully, she doesn't want, obviously, for all good reason not to identify herself. But she regularly talks about the fact when people's chat, when Tommy Robinson is like, say, horrible things about Muslims, she'd mm. be the first person to say that's absolute nonsense. And yet she was a victim mm. of people who shared our faith and shared our background, you know? So uh, there are plenty of champions out there who, who, are, who totally get what we've said. I, I regularly say about my faith that my faith, you know, Sarah, whenever people write, on that, write about me, they did previously, they would say the Muslim chief prosecutor. They mm. would say the Muslim chief executive of police commissioners. Whenever I'm a chair of a college, they never say the Muslim chair of a college. Yeah. They never, I'm a, you know, I'm the member of Ipso, the Muslim member of the... Pro- no, my faith becomes important to them when I'm in a position of influence and decision-making and power, you know? Yeah. But for me, my faith doesn't define me. Yeah. My faith refines me. My faith has made me a better person. Mm. My faith has made me understand how things operate and how things could operate and should be. But it doesn't define me. I don't want people to define me by my faith mm. because, because I think that's, that's just lazy journalism or lazy full stop. Yeah. Great, great answer, Nazir. Um, uh, we have uh, Salma Hamid has made a comment, must just need to step up and show good leadership. Um, Shahid again, uh, 
What are your reasons for feeling optimistic about the future of minority and Muslim communities in the UK? Well, I've, I've, I've dedicated my book, strange as it may sound, it reads, to our children. Mm. And people might think that's my children I'm talking about. No, I'm talking about our children. Because all the problems that we have are created by us, the adults. All the solutions are held by our children. And, and so my optimism is that when I talk to my children, they are, if I inadvertently, unconsciously say something, I don't know, bigoted, bigoted or something, they will take me to task. Mm. Dad, you can't say that. What are you talking about, Dad? You know? and, <laughs> and so my hope is that our children actually can put right uh, our sins, our issues, our bigotry, our hate. And so my optimism comes from the fact that when I talk to children, and I do all over the country, uh, that I can see that they get it, many of them more, many more that get mm. it than, than our adults, and ultimately we'll die out and they'll fix it. Fantastic. Um, Nuzat um, has said, thank you, Nazir, for a fab book. As a non-lawyer, I found it incredibly compelling. I'm very proud to see a fellow Marlborough Road School alumni <laughs> um, achieving so much. Uh, Mohammed Amin says, how does Nazir assess the support from community organisations such as the Muslim Council of Britain? Uh, good question, Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I've had my run-ins with the MCB. Uh, I remember, a few, I think this is a matter of public record, a few years ago they asked me to speak in an event um, about Muslims. This was after Rochdale and everything else. And, and they had on the agenda, Nazir Azhar will talk about hate and Islamophobia. And I said, hang on, hang on. can I also talk about Muslims as, uh, you know, potential perpetrators or they happen to be Muslims, you know? And, uh, it, so I, I was a bit bewildered that uh, it goes back to my point earlier on. It's easy, easy for us to, our default position is to deal with the areas where we are the victims mm -hmm. rather than where we, we might be the problem. The MCB uh, have got better, abundantly better in the last two or three years. Previously, it was, uh, here's a press release, you know, uh, proactive, not proactive at all, very reactive. Um, but we shouldn't be all putting all our, uh, eggs in one basket. There are lots of, Concordia is a good example, there are lots of great networking organizations, representative organizations, uh, they need to step up and they are stepping up. They just need to get the same level of publicity uh, that some of these larger ones do. Uh, we don't have the strong voices um, that other faith communities have, I think. Um, but I've, I've had a conversation or two with the current government, Colin Bloom, sadly mm. will know, uh, is the faith czar, uh, and I've spoken to him. So I'm hopeful that uh, we will be much stronger going forward. Uh, but as I said, uh, we've, we've got to move on from just seeing ourselves as victims all the time. We've got to start thinking about uh, how we can improve the country that we're, we live in. Mm. Got a really interesting question now, Nazir, for you from Sadia. Um, hi, Nazir. It's a pleasure listening to you. Really enjoying your book. Have you had any recent interactions with the Pakistani government regarding putting in place safeguarding legislation for women and children? Uh, you, you know, um, <laughs> in January last year, I was asked by uh, DFID uh, to do some work on uh, law reform in Pakistan. Wow. So uh, I, had, I went to, last time I went to Pakistan was 2002. Mm. And then since that, uh, because for my father's funeral, and then in 2018, uh, 2019, up to, to, to date, in the last 14 months, I've been to Pakistan 13 times, wow. right? I go mm. for a week every month. Uh, Saida knows this because we've run into each other in <laughs> passing in Lahore, or nearly did. Um, uh, and my job there is to help them on rule of law reform. And there's, there is a real appetite and real openness. It's paid for by DFID, uh, but it's supported entirely by the Pakistan government. We won't do anything that they are not supportive of. I've worked with inspector generals, with the prosecution division, with judiciary and with prisons and, pop and others and NGOs. And we are one, one massive success, uh, I can share it with you, it is in the KP province, which is um, the Northern province. Uh, mm -hmm. For the first time ever, they've, they've recruited 29 victim support officers, the police have, uh, all women, uh, all providing victim support. That's, we've helped them develop Impressive. the guidance. Yeah. We've done the training for them. Uh, and so they now have victim support officers. They now have video link in uh, Punjab courts. Uh, and they have a domestic violence court in Lahore. You know, wow. uh, uh, I am absolutely gobsmacked at what Fantastic. can be achieved 
uh, by that kind of liaison, that kind of engagement. And God willing, I'll carry on doing that for the foreseeable future. That is absolutely, that's another book, Nazia there, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some things you don't want to share. <laughs> yeah. uh, so some of those conversations, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, mentioned you, I mentioned you earlier about how difficult it is in Bradford. Just imagine how difficult it is talking to a group of yeah. Pakistani men yeah. in Pakistan. Yeah, I think if anyone can do it, you can do it though, Nazir. Um, I'm doing my best. I'm doing, you're my, doing best. your best. We have five minutes left uh, and I really want to know now what is next for Nazir Afzal? People have hinted at political career. Um, do you know, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, uh, as I said, I, I, I'm grateful to all, all my fantastic networks and friends. I'm, I'm still involved in, in the Press Standards organization. Mm. I, I'm chair of a college, um, Hopwood Hall here in Greater Manchester. I'm doing the uh, Pakistan law reform work. Uh, I'm, um, I'm really well engaged in so many different things. You know, I, I made a judgment, uh, it's the right thing to do, that I will never work for anybody ever again. Mm. You know, everything I do will be advisory, will be consultancy, would be me my, doing my own thing. Uh, and, uh, and I hope to do much more of that going forward. Uh, wherever, wherever you know, Allah allows me to go, wherever, uh, you know, all of my successes are due to Allah. All, all the failures are mine, yeah. Sarah. Uh, yeah. and, and I will carry on. Uh, if somebody says to me, Nazir, can you do this? Uh, I have the time available, then I'll do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I get bored very easily. One of the reasons I left prosecuting was it got boring for me. Strange as it may sound, dealing with 150,000 cases a year, yeah. uh, managing 1,400 people, that I got bored. I got bored because the names may change, but the evidence remains the same. Somebody's been hurt. Yeah. And if I can do anything to stop people being hurt in the first place, then that's much more fulfilling. Wow, I think you, you have, I think, prosecuted in, in the um, number of about a million people, I think. Yeah, of, of yeah. Your I've, I've, supervised, I've supervised or prosecuted myself about a million cases during 25 years. Yeah. And, you know, I, there are many, many, many that have left an enormous mark on me. And I hope through this book that I can yeah. share some of those impacts with you. Because, you know, if I can do anything to inspire people and motivate, motivate better. Everybody yeah. around this table is already doing great stuff. Uh, and we all need motivation. I need motivation sometimes. But when I'm feeling down, you know, somebody can come to me and say, Nazir, yeah. come on, let's do it. Mm. I need that. We all need it. See, that's the point. It's not a legal book uh, no. just because it's written about a lawyer. It really is a lesson in whatever comes your way in life. Use yeah. that to sort of improve or change the things around you. You know, very, there were very 10,000 There were 10,000 lawyers in this country better than me at law. You know, <laughs> uh, I know what to do with it. Yeah. And I think that's what that's all I'm yeah. hopefully able to share in this book is how you can use law as a force for good uh, yeah. and and how we can work together to do that. Yeah, no, it's, it's been honestly fantastic to read it. I'm going to read it again because I just, you know, you just don't want to put it down. Like I say, it's OK, written by a lawyer. They've got legal cases, but the, the, the implications of what happened everyone needs to read this book to find out how you've sort of changed um, the future of, of law and how it's applied. Um, yeah. How how's your family? The kids really uh, happy that dad's around more now? Uh, they would have been, yeah. My, my youngest is uh, 18, uh, 19th birthday tomorrow, so he's oh, happy well. I'm here because he's got his list of presents, uh, <laughs> which, are, which are really important to him. Um, but, you know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I'll be honest with you, Sarah, mm. this five-week lockdown and, and uh, not being able to Pakistan, for example, has been probably the first break I've had in 25 years. Mm. It's the strangest thing, isn't it? A lot of people I, I have said all of, well, all of us yeah. probably think of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, you know, I feel relaxed. Yeah. I feel, obviously my brother died and that is absolutely terrible. And I'm dealing mm. also with my mother's illness. Mm. But you know, I feel able to do that. I feel human again. Yeah. Uh, and I've laughed a bit, you know, yeah. which uh, sometimes is difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think if anything I've got in touch with bits of me, quite frankly, uh, that I was on doing on autopilot. Yeah, and any of your children inspired to follow into my, the law? My daughter, my daughter just gra my daughter graduated in law just a few, few months ago okay. from Bristol University. And she, thank you, and she's made, it, she's made it abundantly clear she doesn't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> uh, she wants to go into politics, actually, Sida, so if you need an intern, <laughs> uh, she'll come and work with you without a doubt. Uh, my, my second son is, my, my first son, my, my second child, is studying mm. politics in Glasgow University. Yeah. He doesn't want to be a politician. Uh, my third son is studying at Liverpool University in music production. And he's, wow. he can play, play every instrument under the sun. And my youngest son, he's on Spotify, verified on Spotify. He mixes, honest to God. They've all, they're all following their passions. And I recommend to any parent, do not, as I was told by my father, you can't be this, can't, 
No, do not tell your children what, what, they, what they should be. Let them follow their passions. And they are making me immensely proud by doing so. Wow, brilliant advice um, to end on, Nazir. Thank you so much. I could talk to you for hours You're most on welcome. end. But thank you for your time. And then wish, wish you best of luck for everything in the My future. Pleasure. Thank you. Once again, Have Nazir. a good day, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Nazir, as well. Remember, Bye -bye. his book is The Prosecutor, out now. You can get it on Amazon and anywhere else. Thank you thank again you for know. joining us, thank sharing you. your time. Take care now. Bye now. Bye. And thank you, Sarah, as well, for a brilliant interview. You, and I'm glad it's you were able to, to do it from a point of view of actually reading the book in a oh, matter of hours. It. Thank oh, you so Zahid, much. I could have taken over the whole slot today. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. Um, again, I want to thank everyone also who's joined us for this session. We, it's not the end. We're going to continue. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the founder uh, and president of Concordia Forum, uh, Madassar Ahmed. He is going to introduce our next guest. And again, thank you so much for staying with us. We've got another eight hours of programming to go. You can look at our Twitter feed or Facebook page to see the full schedule. So over to Madassar. Well, 